Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 28, Chapter 28. Shota's eyes glare at the clock across from him. He sat in a hospital waiting room, dread pulling in his stomach as he clutches the landline phone the receptionist had so graciously allowed him to use in one hand. He has everything he needs to call Hizashi, but he still hesitates. It's nearing the early hours in the morning, a perfectly reasonable time to be calling his husband. Considering Hizashi will already be up and about, probably getting ready for patrol, he's an early bird. Still, Shota can't seem to make his fingers dial the numbers to his husband's cell phone. He can't seem to force his limbs to do anything. The phone hangs in a limp hand, and his other hand flattens over the keypad on the landline. His fingers itch to press the buttons of the familiar number, but he just can't move. The attack on the training camp had come out of nowhere. Multiple villains had taken over the forest and attacked a bunch of fifteen-year-olds. Who does that? Who targets kids? It had taken hours to round up all the students after the villains seemed to just stop and disappear suddenly, all forty of them, in various stages of consciousness, quite a few injured and all with haunted, blank looks in their eyes. Or the ones conscious, at least. For half of the students, Vlad, his 1B kids, this is the first villain attack they've actually encountered. Shota remembers seeing the looks on their faces, on his own kids after the USJ. But even after having seen those looks before, it never makes it easier. The hollowness in their gaze is almost unseeing. Thrown headfirst in the world of heroes and villains, Shota's own kids weren't much better, though. Shoji, Todoroki, Uraraka, Asui, and Tokiyami had seemed to come out of this the worst of most of his students, haunted eyes with something sickeningly aghast in their gazes. He'd asked what happened, mind cluttered with tasks and worries, but trying to get them his full attention. It's strangely upsetting how quiet his usually loud and rambunctious students are in that moment, worrying. None had said much when Shota had finally gotten his hands on them, hurriedly checking them over before ushering a bleeding shoji and an unconscious 1B student towards a waiting ambulance while he directed the others to join everyone else while the roundup commenced. They were still students, and there were some still to find and villains to capture, and he could deal with the trauma later. He didn't have time to pry into them when there were still students missing. For now, he'd let medical personnel and trained officers look after his students. One by one, they found them. Some unconscious in the woods due to that gas quirk that the students had reported. Some curled into themselves, guarding over unconscious villains. Tetsu Tetsu from 1B even had bullet holes, but thankfully mostly unharmed due to his quirk. Most of the students sported scrapes and bruises. The majority, though, weren't seriously injured. Small mercies, in the grand scheme of things. Well, unless being unconscious counted, then a lot of the students were down for the count. Shota had scoured the forest for students. Along with the police and rescue services, every student found was a tiny weight off his shoulder, but even those tiny bouts of relief couldn't make up for the fact that they'd been attacked by villains. Again. They'd found the students, most of them, thirty-eight of them. There'd been two missing students, and a bitter taste had filled his mouth before he even returned back to the lodge, where the kids were waiting to do a head count of who was still unaccounted for. Fear swirls and showed his stomach when he finally makes it back to the lodge, the students are all patiently waiting, those injured and unconscious already loaded into ambulances and on their way to the hospital for treatment, while everyone else sat packed in together in little friend groups. The sight of his students, huddled together, is one he probably won't ever forget. They've never looked so young before. Shota's churning stomach turns acidic when Azuka's message from earlier, passed on by Mandalay, echoes through his mind. We've discovered one of the villain's targets. It's one of the students, Kachan. The thought of it now makes him sick. Especially since... Has anyone seen Bakugo? Shota had called loudly over those conscious and well enough to take one of the buses to the hospital. The dread had pulled tenfold in his stomach as Uraraka's lip wobbled and Tokiyami turned away from him guilty. Todoroki's expression had been grim, but emotionless as Asui had curled into herself even more so from where she'd been hugging her knees to her chest. Shota swallowed, trying to keep his voice neutral despite the panic. Or Midoriya. He'd known, then, that there was something very, very wrong. Izuku's friend group without Izuku? Those haunted, crestfallen expressions? How none of those four students seemed to be able to look him in the eye? Shota should have known better than to be optimistic that they'd find Izuku and Bakugo hidden away in some bush, safe and sound, or even to find them unconscious on the forest ground. Anything was better than the dark thoughts snaking deeper into his mind as he stares at his wilted students. 
The last he'd seen of his foster kid, Izuku had been barreling towards the heart of the attack, keen on finding Mandalay and delivering both of his own messages for his classmates, as well as Shota's order for them to fight back. Shota knew nothing would stop the kid from getting to Bakugo, but where the hell is Bakugo? Shota could only pray both of them would show up in some way or some fashion. The forest was huge, maybe, just maybe, they'd gotten lost. Strayed from the path, had gotten off track and ended up lost in the depths of the forest altogether. Maybe. There had been nine ambulances surrounding them that had shown up pretty fast. Shota doesn't know who made the call, probably one of the pussycats, but he's relieved when reinforcements arrive. Along with the ambulances, six police cars arrived, as well as two fire trucks, not to mention the dozens of water-based quirks that were working rapidly in an attempt to contain the hell-raging fire that was spreading through the trees. Midway into the search, roughly half the students located and sent either into ambulances or the lodge where they were conscious. Relatively uninjured students were waiting. Two separate search and rescue units arrived in, as well as a couple of additional heroes that turned up to aid and rescue and first aid. And as if that weren't already bad enough, Vlad receives exactly two calls from Nezu, both of which aren't even noticed, with the teachers actively scouring the forest with search and rescue in a hurried attempt to locate those still unaccounted for students. Show to shore his phone, wherever it is, will also have missed calls from the rat, too. If Nezu knew about the attack at that point, while they were still in the process of finding kids, arresting villains, putting out the fire, and treating injuries, Shota knew it wouldn't be long until this was on the news. Until the media sinks its teeth into it. Until everything comes to light, including pro-hero negligence. Khan's negligence, the Pussycat's negligence, and most importantly, Shota's own negligence. He was supposed to be there. He was supposed to keep them safe. And he hadn't. God, what a fucking mess. The man slumps down further in his seat, drawing in a heaving breath as he thumbs at his aching eyes. His eye solution had gotten lost somewhere in the mess of the fight, or even in the rounding up of traumatized high schoolers. Honestly, his eye drops are probably in the same place his cell phone is, wherever the hell that is. Shota lets his head thump against the wall that he's leaning against, and blows out a shaky breath. He really shouldn't be putting this call off like he is. It's illogical. There are more important things that he can be doing instead of this. He needs to be with his students. He needs to be getting into contact with guardians. He needs to talk to Nezu and the police and the doctors and his kids. He wants to check in with all of them, assess them with his own eyes, and be thankful they're all right. He's itching to do another head count of his students, desperate for his class count to make it to 20 instead of that sickening 18 that had speared through his heart like a dagger. He knows it won't, but he can't help but pray that he miscounted somehow, even though he's well aware the change in scenery won't magically make his numbers add up. He feels like the worst teacher in existence as he sits here, worried about a phone call, while his kids are injured and unconscious, and have been through one hell of a fight that they're still too young to be dealing with. How his class of first years have seen more action than the third years graduating this year. There's so much he needs to be doing, so why is he having such a hard time contacting Hisashi? This, logically, should be the easiest thing to, on his to-do list. It's Hisashi, his husband. He's called his husband hundreds of times, if not thousands, in all the years they've known each other. This time shouldn't be different. But it is. Why does he not want to tell his husband? Hisashi deserves to know that Shota lost not just two of the students, but that one of the students was their foster son. Hisashi deserves to know. Shota snakes a hand up to drag through his knotted hair before he's sitting up. His fingers hover over the keypad before he finally bites the bullet and dials Hisashi's cell number very slowly. It rings three times before the call is answered. Hello, his husband's voice greets cheerfully through the receiver, and Shota can just draw in a stuttered breath. He can't force himself to speak yet, his words caught in his lungs as he listens as Hisashi's on the other end of the phone. Hisashi is quiet for all of three seconds, and when he finally speaks again, Shota can hear the confusion in his voice. Hello, who is this? Zashi. Shota greets blandly, fingers shaking as he holds the phone to his ear. The call of his husband's name tastes acidic, but Shota knows Hisashi will hang up if no one says anything, especially since he's calling from an unknown number. Show? His husband chirps in reply, and Shota winces at the sound, heart dropping in his stomach. His mouth is dry, and he desperately wants to talk, but he can't seem to find his own voice. Oh, hey, what's up, babe? Hey, why aren't you calling from your cell? Shota opens his mouth to reply, but it shuts just as fast. His grip on the phone tightens to the point that he thinks he might actually crack the hard plastic. He loosens his grip. Wait, what are you even calling me for? Hisashi's tone curls into a placeful accusation. I thought reception up at the lodge was bad. 
Miss me so much that you needed to hear my voice. Hisashi. Shota croaks out his husband's full name, a rarity. His voice cracks, and he squeezes his aching eyes shut. They're red, and dry and irritated. Shota just knows that if he had any moisture left, he'd be crying. Hey, 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 Shota, wait a sec. Are, are you... Sweetheart, what's wrong? Are you all right? Did something happen at this boot camp? Did Zuku break another bone? Are you calling from the hospital? I thought that number looked familiar. Is he okay? Shota can't manage to say anything, but he does try to draw in a shaky breath. He drags the hand, not holding the phone down his face, choking on his words as he tries to contain his emotions in the not-so-private reception area. Shota, Izashi says, lowly, serious. The blonde-haired man draws in his own anxious breath on the other end of the line, and Shota knows, he knows, that his husband has figured out this isn't a courtesy call. Show what? Where is Suzuku? Put him on the phone. They took him, Sensei. Uraraka had whispered brokenly, so softly that Shota had to strain to hear her. And when he did make the words out, replaying soft admission in his own head three times before it finally clicked, his mind froze like someone had dropped a bucket of ice water right over his head. Shota let the words sink in for another long second before he dumbly responds, What? The villains, Todoroki clarifies, even though Shota really hadn't been asking, eyes locked on the ground. The villains took Bakugo and Midoriya. We weren't fast enough, we lost them. There was an attack. Shota finally can choke out, digging the heel of his palm into his itchy eyes. Last night, the League of Villains. We were ambushed. They were new quirks. Hizashi, new villains. They, they targeted the students. There was some kind of poisonous vapor quirk that knocked the students out. And bloodthirsty villains. Most of the kids were hurt, and more than half of them lost consciousness. We... I... I fuck. Shota, the blonde croaks desperately. Please... Please tell me everyone is safe. I'm so sorry. Shota wipes furiously at his eyes, those three words soaked with distraught. They have him, Zashi. They got Izuku. They got Bakugo, too, and I... Fuck, I don't... I didn't protect them, Izashi. They took my kids. They took two of my kids. The quirk you have now is unique, and you should know its origin. Izuku looks across the table at All Might, a frown pulling on his lips. It's the first time he's really seen the pro since Hosu and Izuku's encounter with the hero killer. He sees All Might in classes, but with both of their schedules so hectic, they barely have a moment to talk. Izuku leans into the conversation. This is the first time All Might had really talked about One for All. Izuku knows how it's passed by DNA, and he knows it's haunted by past users, but there's so much he doesn't know about this age-old quirk. He can't say he's never been curious. He's had questions about it since before receiving it on the day of the entrance exam, but he's never wanted to push... He believes in All Might, and he knows his hero will tell him what he needs to know when he needs to know it. One for All was derived from another odd quirk, a power that's very old. Izuku pauses at the information. It used to be something different. All Might bows his head in a solemn nod. The pro studies Izuku for a long second before finally continuing. That name of that quirk is all for one. It allowed its user to take quirks from others, and the user could keep the quirks for himself or give them to someone else. Izuku spent a lot of years studying quirks, and he's never heard of anything like that. But then again, he'd also never heard of being able to transfer a quirk via DNA. Still, the idea of being able to take someone's quirk is a scary one, especially in a period where quirks are essentially power. Y you mean he could steal quirks? All Might had gone on to tell Izuku about when quirks first started appearing hundreds of years ago. Some of the information he knew from pre-quirk and quirk history classes, while some of the information was new. He'd have never thought there could be anyone as powerful as this supposed all-for-one out there. He'd hardly heard of all-for-one, not anywhere besides the online forums. Izuka could hardly wrap his head around this man, who could do what seemed like the impossible. An overlord of villain worlds, a threat that no one even knows truly existed. I, I've seen rumors about this online, sure, but... Izuku bites the inside of his cheek. Isn't that all just made up? It's not mentioned in our textbooks or talked about in class. All Might sits up a bit straighter before his shoulders slump slightly. Because that's the kind of shameful history people would rather ignore. All Might lets the explanation hang in the air for a second, and Izuku tries to process. How does this all tie together, though? Izuku asks, even though he's starting to piece it together himself. And what about one for all? I said, All for One could give quirks to others, remember? The pro goes on to tell Izuku about All for One's quirk, and motives in more detail. 
How some people can handle quirks being taken or given and others turn into mindless living dolls like the Nomu. Izuku had never suspected that those creatures could have at one point been people. It had never crossed his mind. Once. The thought of it makes him feel sick. Humans, actual human beings, turned into science experiments, into mindless soldiers for Shigaraki. He tells Izuku of how some quirks combined and strengthened, and Izuku has a feeling that he knows where this conversation is going. All Might carries on to tell him of two brothers, one with a powerful quirk and the other quirkless. The more Izuku hears, the more things are starting to slot into place with what he already knows. About one for all, Izuku listens intently, absorbing all the information. It makes sense, in some sick kind of way. Everything was falling into place. He was starting to understand. Don't tell me, Izuku whispers as All Might speaks to the brother of all for one. Describes him broadly, but Izuku's mind instantly flashes back to first, the young, sickly-looking man who'd been in one for all at the hospital with him. First was this villain's brother, all for one. One for all. Brothers. Izuku feels sick. Yes, even though he was thought to be quirkless, turns out the brother did have a quirk. Though he had never realized this to be the case, he had a useless power that only allowed him to pass on quirks. Izuku stares wide-eyed as All Might finishes the story. And so, the stockpiling quirk merged with the younger brothers, his power, and that is how One for All came to be. Izuku swallows down the anxious churn of his stomach as he tries to make sense of the information he was given, the warning to watch out for All for One, a reminder that he's alive, and that he's out there. A lot of it makes sense, though, if he could correct one thing after meeting All for One's brother, he'd say that the quirk didn't merge with First Power, but with First himself. Izuku swallows down the memory, the explanation, the... the warning. That's what it had been, at the time. Izuku hadn't thought anything of it. All Might had simply been explaining the villain to him, explaining the quirk that was now a part of him to him. How one for all was connected to this apparent villain world all over Lords and all for one. It had felt like nothing more than a story at the time. But now, roped up and slumped against a wall in the villain's lair, he's starting to see it for what it really had been. All Might had been warning him about all for one warning about his power, about the dangers. And Izuku hadn't heeded it. He'd hardly given it a second thought, really, had brushed the villain to the depths of his mind until faced with Shigaraki. He honestly hadn't thought about his conversation with All Might until the mall incident, where he'd all but begged Shigaraki for an answer, that the villain either hadn't known honestly, or hadn't felt like sharing. All for one really must still be alive, even though he never doubted All Might, it's still just a lot to accept. Someone living for over two hundred years... But he really is still alive, creating Nomus and leading Shigaraki along as a mentor, training him to be the next biggest threat Japan has ever seen. Izuku stirs against his restraints, wincing and sucking in a pained wheeze through his teeth as his bounds jostle his injuries. He's not sure how long he's been here at this point, sat slumped against the wall, the pain of his injuries being tugged and his body being yanked without regard, accompanied by the fact that the void travel certainly wasn't pleasant, had made him pass out. When he'd woken up again, he'd already been tied up and was left almost completely alone in the dark. Seedy-looking bar of some sort. He can only assume it's some time in the day if the bar is lifeless. He supposes if the villains are more active at night, they'd probably sleep more during the day, and then there was the fact that bars don't tend to open until the evening anyways. It's still questionable how much business this bar gets. Izuka can only imagine a seedy-looking bar like this one would be buried in the depths of the shadier parts of town a villain hideout that caters to other villains and lowlifes. Despite his injuries, they'd still felt the need to tie him up. Two broken arms, a black eye that he can barely see out of, obvious quirk exhaustion and plain old normal exhaustion, and they'd still thought it necessary to tie him. They'd been kind enough to let him keep the makeshift splints on his arms that kept the injuries straight and aligned, so they weren't entirely incapacitating due to sharp pain. Now, as Suzuku stares down at his blurry arms... He's so glad that Uraraka had thought to do this for him. It'd been a spur-of-the-moment thing, she and her friends, searching out long, straight sticks and tying them to Izuku's arms with Uraraka's torn shirt and binding the sticks into place. The relief of it had been almost instant, but now he's afraid it's not helping as much. His adrenaline has faded and he's exhausted and sore. If he hadn't have gotten himself kidnapped too, he's sure he probably would have been in the hospital right now, maybe even with Hazashi and Shota at his side. Still... He'll have to remember to thank Uraraka for her quick thinking when he gets out of here. If he gets out of here. They were still afraid of what he could do, even when he doubts he'll be able to do anything. He can hardly feel his body, let alone stand and walk away. 
Besides, even if he could get himself out of the restraints, manage to force himself up and leave, there's a flaw to that logic. Mizuku turns his head to the side, where Kachan is unconscious. He's muzzled, chained to his chair. Mizuku feels bad that his childhood friend is physically chained, fully restrained and immobile, when Izuku himself is bound with ropes that, if he had a little more strength and a couple less broken limbs, he'd be able to escape. He won't leave Kachan. His sole intention, when he'd surged for the void, had been to get to Kachan. Ideally, he would have preferred to pull Kachan back with him, instead of being grabbed and pulled along with the villains, but you can't win them all. Perhaps he's not as scary when he's injured and can hardly move on his own, who would have thought? Ah, it appears you're awake. Zuku jolts up, wincing as his weary eyes land on the owner of the voice. I apologize, Midori Izuku, but Shigaraki Tomura is currently resting. We didn't anticipate you waking quite yet. The man walks calmly behind the bar, where he seats to work as if there's not two children tied up off to the side of the room. He's organizing glass bottles of alcohol, arranged on the shelving units behind the counter, as well as wiping out what looks to be freshly washed glasses with a white towel and stacking them under the counter. What? Izuku swallows, his throat so dry that the words feel like sandpaper. What time is it? Time? The villain hums thoughtfully. It's just after 3 p.m. I'm afraid you still have a bit of waiting to do until Shigaraki wakes up. It was a rather long night for him, and the others, as I'm sure you've noticed. Izuku swallows again and shifts until he's fully facing the bar, where the villain works quietly. He hadn't expected any civil conversation when he'd first woken up and realized where he was. He'll take what he can get. Villains not trying to kill him is a step up from what he's seen so far as a hero in training. Izuku tries to keep his noises to himself as he shifts around, but pain surges up his arms and settles at his core. He's never had to just live with broken limbs like this. He must not be quiet enough, as yellow eyes flicker in his direction, as it seems like the villain is almost pondering. It seems like you've had a rather rough night as well, he comments idly, as if he's just taken notice of Izuku's state. I take it you were the one to run into muscular. Not many of our members can do so much damage. It's rather impressive that you walked out of that fight alive, Midori Izuku. As expected of a UA student, I suppose. Something about how the villain says his name, thoughtful and accusing all the same, makes a chill crawl up his spine. He has half a mind to turn away from the villain's direction, but he also doesn't want to show any weakness. He's already battered. He doesn't want to look weak, too. The villain's yellow eyes watch him for a second longer before his attention is dropping back to where he's toweling off a glass. And if that's the case, I assume you're the reason Muscular was not at the getaway meeting spot, meaning you must have defeated him somehow. Izuku swallows nervously at the accusatory hum. He waits for the villain to stalk towards him, ready to threaten him or beat him to taking out one of their members. He even winces when a cup is set on the counter with a faint click of a glass hitting hardwood. The villain makes no move to come any closer, and after a long second of nothing moving, Izuku slivers his eyes open to see the villain hasn't moved an inch from his spot, had simply reached for the glass next to the towel. The villain clicks his tongue distastefully. He was nothing but extra hands anyways. Too focused on his own agenda instead of Shigaraki Tomura's. Oh well, it seems like it's the police's problem now. Uzuka's not sure how someone can sound so spiteful yet devoid of any and all emotion at the same time. Ruthless, is all Uzuka can think. They'd lost members, but this villain doesn't seem to be bothered. He doubts any of the villains will be. He wonders how the rankings work. If no one cares that they're down at least one, if not more, if his classmates were as successful as he was, of their members. The boy ducks his chin down, swallowing nervously. The action tickles at the back of his dry throat, prompting a cough that he tries to contain. The little cough turns into a full fit that brings tears to his eyes. He tries desperately to swallow them down, but it doesn't work. How rude of me. You're our guest. The villain sighs, setting the towel on the countertop as he turns with the glass in his hand to the sink. I'll get you some water. I would hate for you to wake up Shigaraki Tomura. Izuku's coughing fit is dying down when the villain finally rounds the bar counter with a glass of water that makes Izuku's mouth water. Or it would, if his body had any moisture to give. The villain pauses once again just before stepping out from behind the bar with a filled glass of water, and Izuku watches as it looks like the villain is blue-screening, staring ahead at nothing before turning to look at Izuku. His eyes don't change, but Izuku swears the villain is squinting at him. You must be in pain. The boy isn't sure whether he should admit the weakness or pretend it's not true. How are you supposed to act when you're being held captive? This hadn't been in any heroics classes yet. Was there a manual for being held hostage? 
He doesn't have to decide either way, because without a word the villain is setting the glass of water on the edge of the counter and turning to disappear into the room that he surfaced from. Zuku can't help the fear that digs into his heart as he's left alone with Kachan again. What could the villain be doing in the other room? Was Shigaraki awake? Was it starting? He'd assume there would be a state of limbo, where the League would sleep, and was that over? Izuku licks at his own dry lips, eyes settling on the glass of water, despite how his mind is trying to push down on his own desperate need for it, not trusting the villain in the slightest. He now realizes just how desperate he is for the water that sits on the edge of the counter, teasing him. It's there, right there in front of him, but so far, out of reach. Was this just a game? A villain waving something his body is desperate for, begging for, in front of his face because it's fun. The door opens again, and Izuku braces for the worst. Except it's just the void quirk, villain returning. Izuku shifts a little to glance around the villain to see if anyone else is following, but he's alone. And he only gets a peek into the other room before the door swings shut. He can only imagine Shigaraki and the rest of the League of Villains are sleeping somewhere back there. Here we are, the villain says in a way of announcing his return. This should help. In his hand is a pill bottle. Dread pulls into Zuku's stomach as he watches the villain shake out a couple pills before recapping the bottle and sliding it into the pocket of his trousers. With his newly empty second hand, the villain picks up the glass of water and moves towards Izuku. It's not much, the villain hums out indifferently as he crouches in front of Izuku. Izuku doesn't think the villain is trying to be threatening, but he is. But it's better than nothing, I suppose. Some kind of drugs? Izuku winces back when the villain's hand holds out two pills. You're drugging me? Sorry, but I'd rather be in pain than be drugged. Drugging you? The villain's voice twists with confusion. Certainly not. The villain withdraws the pill bottle that he tucked into his pocket, and Izuku narrows his eyes at the Advil label. He was being offered Advil? What the hell? Ibuprofen, the villain states matter-of-factly, as if Izuku hadn't just read the label. We may be villains, Midori Izuku, but we aren't invincible. Even villains suffer from headaches, fevers, and injuries. It's regular over-the-counter Advil. I like to keep it on hand for Shigaraki Tomura and his friends. It's not much, I'm afraid. Your injuries appear to be quite bad. The villain looks like he's about to make some comment about Izuku's injuries being hospital-worthy, but seems to think better of it. But it will help a bit with the pain. Izuku stares suspiciously, but the villain doesn't appear to be phased. Yellow, flickering eyes stare unseeingly into deep, tired green. Izuku drops his eyes down to the two small pills that are held outstretched, and then to the glass of water before he's looking up at the void, granulated face of this villain. Are you supposed to be doing this? It didn't make sense. They should want him in pain. He's being held captive. Shigaraki wants to kill him. And he'd made that perfectly clear after his parting words at the mall. That would be the vibe that he'd given off as he walked away. Why would this villain be offering him pain relief? The villain cocks his head to the side. You're our guest, as of now. Until Shigaraki Tomura decides what to do with you, you are, after all, a special interest of his. You are not our target, merely a reward that Shigaraki had selected. I wasn't the target, Izuku glares down at his lap. But Bakugo was. Why? The villain regards him, but doesn't answer. Izuku frowns at that, as he lifts his head to strain and look at the villain, changing his approach. Will Shigaraki be upset that you're helping me? I was never told not to help you, the villain blinks slowly. And this hardly counts as aid. Advil is hardly a decent pain reliever for such injuries as yours. The relief you'll feel will be minimal. Izuku shifts against the ropes, tying him to the leg of Kachan's chair. Truthfully, if that really is Advil, it won't help much. As the villain said, it'll hardly help with the pain at all. He's in so much pain, and he's fresh out of adrenaline, his body just begging to sleep, so he's really not a flight risk at the moment. The decision is entirely yours. You'll be sitting for a long while as of now. Shigaraki Tomura and his friends will not be waking until this evening. The Advil will just take the edge off and ease your pain a small amount. Besides, even with a little bit of pain relief, you're still tied up. Your arms will still be broken, and... The villain paused, his yellow eyes flickering to a still unconscious... Kachan. I highly doubt you'll make an escape without your friend. That would be counterproductive considering you'll try to run into my void instead of away from it, simply because Dobby had a hold of Baka Gokatsuki. Izuku's nose wrinkles as he squints at the villain still crouched in front of him. It's all true, but still, he's annoyed this villain is pointing it all out, laying out Izuku's entire thought process without much of his own thoughts. The ability to read him like an open book almost reminds him of his guardians, Vobaro. 
Very few people are actually able to read him, and it sucks that this villain is one of them. Usuku wilts as a desperate feeling of loneliness and longing tugs at his heart. He misses them. He wishes more than anything at Oboro was here with them. That had been the biggest shock that when he'd woken up on the floor in some villain bar slash lair, that he was alone. You do not need to take them, the villain finally says after a long second of the two of them just staring at one another. It's merely an offer. I don't care either way, Midori Izuku. You are not one that I am here to protect. It is of no difference to me whether or not you take the pain relief. Izuku swallows again, looking down once more between the hand of pills and the hand holding out the glass of water. He desperately wants both, but the question is, does he trust this villain's word? It's not smart to take some sort of pill from a stranger, let alone a known villain, but at what point does that stop mattering? At what point does desperation take over and cloud your judgment? The pain will just get worse from here on out. At what point do you take the L when you're being held against your own will with multiple broken limbs and hurt to the point that it blurs your vision? Who... who are you? Uzuku manages out as he eyes the glass in the villain's hand. It's silly that he thinks he feels even just a little bit better when he has a name for the villain. If the villain gives him that much, at least. Even without a name, Izuku's still leaning towards taking the villain up on the offer. The water is crystal clear and the glass is shiny, sparkly clean. The care put into the bar counter doesn't match the general atmosphere of the rest of the bar. It's just so tempting. He hadn't had water since at least yesterday morning, if the villain had been honest about the current time. Izuku had done a lot of training with very few breaks and then he'd been thrown into that fight with Muscular. The only water he had was Coda's water quirk splashing onto his face. Ah, oh, my apologies. The villain's thin, yellow eyes flicker with understanding. My name is Kurugiri. I'm here to watch over Shigaraki Tomura, and I run this bar in my spare time. Patience flows from the man in waves. It's strangely not villainous. This level of calm patience is not what Izuku thinks of when he thinks of the word villain. Izuku knows he's been a handful, being so obviously mistrusting, rightfully so, considering the situation. But still, the man doesn't waver or retract the offer. He stays crouched, calm, and collected. There's not a hint of annoyance or frustration. It's weird. Finally, Izuku gives a tiny nod. His throat is so dry it aches. His arms and joint pain through his body at every breath. He wants to take the edge off, even if it doesn't have high hopes that the Advil will really do as suggested. He's desperate enough that he's willing to put just an ounce of trust into this villain. Or maybe the villain is lying and he'll be drugged. At this point, he's not sure which outcome he'd rather. Neither seems better than the other, being drugged but potentially being pain-free, or not being drugged but living with injuries that'll only get worse the longer they're untreated. If Shota, Hisashi, and Oboro ever find out, he's probably dead meat, but now? Now he's desperate. For a second, Kurigiri doesn't move, even after Izuku's consenting nod. He holds both the pill and the glass out just before him, before finally seeming to realize Izuku is in no state to grab anything, both because of his broken arms and the fact that he's still tied up. Ah, Kurigiri finally mutters, and then his hand is lifting the two pills to Izuku's mouth. The teen wrinkles his nose as he hesitates one final time before throwing caution to the wind as he opens his mouth just enough for the villain to pop the pills in. Following that, Kurigiri lifts the glass to Izuku's lips with a surprising amount of gentleness. Izuku chases the pills down with a cautious, mistrusting sip of the water before his desperate instincts kick in and he's greedily drinking the full glass, with the villain's help. He can almost hear Shota's grumbling disapproval in the back of his mind as he blindly trusts this villain. He doesn't taste anything weird in the water, not that he'd know if there was something off about it. He'd seen it come directly from the tap and the glass hadn't left his sights, but he's still wary. He was so desperate for water that he's sure any water would have tasted good as that water did. When the water was gone, Kurigiri stands up to his full height. He stares down at Izuku with unblinking yellow void-like eyes, but doesn't say anything. His fingers hold the rim of the empty glass, and his other hand tucked into the pocket of his slacks. Izuku feels small, under the villain's intimidating glance. Almost as if reading Izuku's thoughts, Kurigiri turns on his heels and makes his way behind the counter. He resumes the task of tidying the bar, eyes never straying from what he's doing. It's like he's completely unbothered by the fact there are two high school students being held hostage. Repetitive sounds fill the silence of the bar, fingers swiping across wet glass as the villain picks them up, inspects them, and then towels them dry. The clinking of glasses and glass bottles of alcohol as he puts everything away, presumably preparing for when the bar opens this evening. Glass sliding on the countertops as shelves, and there are arranged the villain's footsteps as he tidies. It's almost calming. But it's also not. Ropes in captivity are not calming. A chained-up, unconscious childhood friend is not calming. 
Two broken arms are not calming. Not knowing what's waiting for him and Kanchan just around the corner this evening when Shigaraki and his team of villains finally wake up is not calming. This is anything but calming. Slowly but surely, the Advil starts to take effect. It doesn't do much, but the pain isn't as sharp and demanding as it had been when Izuku woke up. He still hurts. He aches. He wishes desperately for a hospital and real numbing medications, for a kiss from recovery girl to mend the breaks, but even then, he's not sure he's got the stamina for it. The difference now from earlier is so minuscule that Izuku barely notices it, but he knows it really is taking a faint edge off of the pain anyway. The boy glares down at his broken arms distastefully before his eyes flit to his childhood friend. It's surprising that Kachan hasn't stirred yet. He should be yelling and screaming, but he's still out. It's worrying. What happened to my friend? Izuku tears his gaze away from Kachan, looking to where Kurigiri has glanced up at him, at his breaking of the silence. The villain looks between the two of them, eyes not moving but head lulling between them. Same thing that happened to you, Kurigiri offers calmly. Travel via my quirk takes some getting used to. It's quite the strain on the body, to not only be consumed by my void, especially against your will, but also to step from one place to another in a matter of seconds. It's a bit of a shock. Exhaustion also played a role in the toll it seemed to take on you and Bakugo Katsuki. Unfortunately, neither of you held on to consciousness. Shigaraki Tomura was most upset upon your arrival. The villain pauses, glancing at the doorway that he'd surfaced from and disappeared through to get the Advil before looking back at Izuku. I confess that that is the only reason I managed to get him and the others to have a rest after such a long night. They were very much looking forward to properly meeting you both. So you guys didn't do anything to him? Kurigiri eyes him, or Zuku thinks he's eyeing him. No, we did not. Magna and Dobby merely tied the both of you up before everyone stepped away to rest. I assured them I'd keep a close eye on the both of you. Zuku's quiet for a second. Why did you take us? Why take Bakugo? Why take me? The villain hesitates. Why us? Sensei and Shigaraki Tomura have plans for Bakugo Katsuki. He was our goal, going into the attack on your training camp. And didn't those words make Izuku's stomach violently churn? As for you, I'm afraid I don't know what Shigaraki Tomura has in store. His decision was a spur of the moment. I was a convenience catch, Izuku breathes out. Kurigiri doesn't say anything for a long second before he finally bows his head in a nod. Shigaraki Tomura is interested in you. And he has been since our attack on the USJ, since he does not share the sentiment. Frankly, I doubt that he's even aware we have two UA students here. It's quite the bold move. But Shigaraki Tomura knows what he's doing. Izuku can only assume that Sensei and all for one are the same person, and if that's correct, he's relieved that the villain world overlord doesn't know he's here. All for one knows about one for all, but if Izuku's correct, he probably thinks All Might still has complete possession of the quirk. Thank God. He'd be screwed over if All for One knew he had the current One for All wielder in this bar, with his organization of villains. Shigaraki obviously knows All for One, if he'd known what Izuku was talking about when the villain departed the mall. Hopefully no one knows that Izuku's the current wielder. Hopefully no one even knows the secret of One for All around here. They lapse into silence after that, and Izuku doesn't bother trying to keep the conversation going. He has questions, of course he does, but Kurigiri is selective about what he'll answer. Suku's not quite sure what the pattern is, why the villain will be open and honest about some things, but closed off and hesitant about others. He doesn't really want to push his luck. Sure, Kurigiri had been nice thus far, but that's not to say that he won't snap at some point. He's a villain, after all. He may be able to lull the Suku into a sort of state of false security, but he's still a villain. He still works for Shigaraki. Kurigiri doesn't seem bothered by the silence, not that Izuku expected it. The villain just carries on milling around the bar as the minutes tick on. For a while, Izuku just watches him. Observes what he's doing, observes the bar they're in, and observes the villain as a whole. This is the second time he's met Kurigiri, technically, so it's weird to see him so relaxed. It's hard to believe that this is the same villain who'd swept Izuku and his classmates into portal voids and deposited them all over the USJ to be killed. Izuku's not sure when he lets his eyes drift shut. He's not asleep, nor is he awake. It's that strange in-between state where you're completely conscious but you're not quite there. He hears noises around him, but he's too tired to force his eyes open and focus. He hears voices, but doesn't open his eyes. He just wants to sleep. He's so tired, and he hurts, and he just wants to go home. Even if he wanted to open his eyes, he's not sure his body would let him. He doesn't truly stir until someone glides over his knuckles, resulting in him jolting up as he forces his eyes open, up onto the figure peering down at him. Oh, good! A feminine voice chirps, and Izuku blinks tiredly up at a girl. 
Deku's awake. Finally, I missed you so, so much while you were asleep. He's not sure he's ever met this girl. He doesn't even remember seeing her ever. Takes Izuku a hazy second to realize that that wasn't a finger ghosting over his knuckles, but the blunt edge of a knife. The tip of the knife edge digs into Izuku's skin as the girl repositions to drag it up over his hand before pressing harder against its wrist, where the makeshift splint starts. The pressure increases, threatening to pierce through his skin. He hardly manages to drag his eyes away from the tip of the knife on his skin, heart pounding as he stares up at her face. She's not looking at his face, lustful eyes watching intently at where the tip of the knife is trailing. I wish I'd seen you while you were bleeding. Magne says you were the one to meet muscular. I bet you would have been so pretty bleeding while fighting him. Don't cut him yet, a monotone voice warns from across the room. You know Shigaraki loses fucking mind if you do anything to the kid without his blessing. I'm not sure any of us can handle another tantrum. Aw, but Dobby, the girl whines, but the knife is slowly pulled away from his wrist. Izuku breathes out a sigh of relief when he notes that there's no bleeding, despite the sting of metal pressing into his skin. You're no fun, but I guess you're right. Shiggy doesn't want me to play with his new toy, no fair. I just know that you would have looked so good bleeding, Deku. The girl's bottom lip juts out as she finally steps away, skipping across the bar to plop down into one of the booths across from a villain wearing black and gray, a costume with a mask covering his entire head. Izuku surveys over the bar while he wills his heart rate to settle. There are new villains, three. Kurigiri's still behind the bar now, mixing a drink for a black-haired, stitched-up man. Izuku assumes that one's Dobby, but he's not entirely sure. That's the direction the monotone voice had come from. Then there's the girl in the middle school uniform and the man in the tight-fitted costume. Izuku wonders how many other villains there are. He's seen four now, but they've talked about more. Plus, there's the villain who trapped Tokiyami and Kachan in the marbles, and he knows Shigaraki's also here. Keep your eyes to yourself, asshole. Don't gop at us. Izuku jerks his attention to where the man in the black costume is almost sneering in his direction. As fast as the sneer is there, it's gone enough that Izuku has whiplash. The sneer melts away as he cocks his head to the side and continues, voice faintly kinder. He looks like a cute little puppy checking us out. You're right, he does. The girl chirps back with a nod. He's so cute. Now, now, Kurigiri's voice is chiding. He slides the finished drink to Dobby, who picks it up and walks to join the two other villains at the booth. He doesn't sit, just leans against the wall at the girl's side. Please calm yourselves. The others are still resting. We're waiting until Shigaraki Tomura joins us. Please leave them alone for now. He's taking forever to get up. The girl whines, slumping dramatically across the table. Yeah, that lazy bastard, the masked one snarls, prompting his following reply of, He deserves some rest. Twice. Toga. Do you two idiots always talk about me when I'm not around? Suku's gaze whips to the doorway where Shigaraki stands slumped. His tone is flared with annoyance, to which the two addressed don't even look the slightest bit bothered. Good evening, Shigaraki Tomura. Kurogiri, Shigaraki huffs in greeting before his gaze seems to zero in on Izuku. There's a hand on his face, but Izuku can see a deranged smile spreading under it. Well, well, looks like my prize is finally awake. I told you we'd be meeting again, disciple. I just never dreamed it'd be so soon. The villain leader steps threateningly towards him. And Izuku knows he should be looking at Shigaraki, but of course he should. The man's a threat. He just can't help when his eyes drop to where someone small is peering out from behind his legs. A child. A little girl, no older than nine, peering at him with dark brown, almost cat-like eyes. Her hair is black, pulled into pigtails, and she's studying him with narrowed eyes. Izuku blinks owlishly at the little girl, and her brows furrow as she blinks back. The League of Villains have a child with them. What the hell? Oboro hadn't known where to go. He'd hardly been able to think straight. He'd lost Izuku. He hadn't been fast enough. He was weightless, massless, intangible being, and he hadn't been fast enough. He'd still let Izuku slip through his fingers. He'd let the boy be stolen away by those villains, by Shigaraki. For a while after the portal was gone from existence, no trace left behind, Oboro can't even manage to pull himself to his feet. He sits there, knees dirtied and hands unmoving where they'd drop to the ground to catch himself when he'd missed the portal. Around him, the students had cried, screamed for Izugu, for Bakugo. They'd shouted their names and cried for them, screamed in defeat before ultimately falling silent. Oboro can't say he was much better. Guilt blanketed over them as a whole, the students, Oboro, all of Izuku's friends, because they hadn't stopped this. They'd all been so close, and yet the villains had been able to grab not just Bakugo, but Izuku as well. None of them had stopped it. They couldn't. And now he was gone. 
Obero stays far longer than any of Izuku's classmates. At some point, the group leaves, defeated and dragging their feet. There's no doubt in his Obero's mind that they're in a search taking place. Shota knows about the attack, and he'll be the first to start rounding everyone up. Obero hopes for his school friend's sake that the rest of the students are all right. Obero just stares at the place where Izuku had disappeared without a trace, the place where, for a few moments, a portal had resided. Now there's nothing. He loses track of time for a while. When he finally pulls himself to his feet, he wanders the general direction of the lodge. He has no motivation to actually return. He feels lost. He feels lonely. It's been months since Obero felt like this. He hadn't felt like this since that first day of school where he'd first met a skittish Izuku, where someone had seen him after thirteen years of isolation. When he does finally get back to the lodge, things are in full swing. Ambulances, police cars, fire trucks, and search and rescue vehicles. Students being ushered along to waiting buses and ambulances are whirring away, sirens blaring. He finds Shota in the center of the mess, eyes blank, and he leads 1A or those remaining onto the bus that they'd arrived in. Obro wonders if Shota knows yet about Izuku and decides that, yeah, he definitely does. That blank look, the horror-filled eyes, the forced neutral expression and the clenched jaw answers that question. Shota's not all right. Not in the slightest. This is hurting him more than anyone else can see, but he's putting on a mask for his students and peers. Obro wonders absently how long it'll take before Shota finally breaks. Probably when he sees Hizashi. He sticks around for Shota for a while following him from room to room as he checks on the students admitted into the hospital with minor injuries. Thankfully, no one was overly hurt, except Izuku, wherever he is. That's the reason why Obro can't bring himself to stay, even if the thought of leaving one of his closest friends at a time like this makes his stomach clench, being in the hospital makes him feel physically sick. Izuku should be here. Izuku should be getting help, and he's not. He'd gotten so hurt, so hurt, broken arms and a bruised eye, not to mention the injuries that were not visible. He should be in a hospital, but instead, he'd been taken. Now he's been kidnapped and he's injured, and it's... it's all Obero's fault. Obero clenches a hand into a fist as the other lifts to grip his hair. Hisashi had been his next stop when he can't bear the thought of the hospital anymore. The blonde, he'd been blissfully unaware of the storm brewing for a little bit. And because of that, Obero could pretend all was fine in the world. He tucked himself in the corner of Shoda and Hizashi's bathroom, while the blonde gelled up his hair and got ready for the day. Hizashi hums to himself, some English song that he'd been obsessed with for the first time in a little while, and if he shuts his eyes, Obro can almost imagine Izuku is tucked away in his bedroom sleeping, and Shoda's passed out on the bed still, and Hizashi's phone rings, and Obro's heart drops to his stomach. He doesn't stick around to watch Hizashi's smile turn into a grimace as the information sinks in. He doesn't stick around to watch his friend brush away tears as he consoles Shota on the other end, and he definitely doesn't stick around as Izashi collapses at the table and sobs after he ends the call with the promise to be right there. There aren't a lot of places Obro can go, none he feels welcome. He thinks about sitting in Izuku's room, he knows it's safe, but he squashes that thought down before it really blooms. Sitting in Izuku's room without Izuku just sounds like torture. He thinks about finding Namuri latching on to her for a little while, until he can calm down and force himself back to the hospital. She should be awake now, too. Classes will still be in session for the rest of the school, and Nezu will want to keep normalcy for as long as he possibly can before news breaks out. The thought of going to find Tensei is brushed off as fast as it appears. He knows Tensei is still hospital-bound, recovering from near death and relearning how to live his life without the use of his legs. Obro knows he can't be in a hospital. Not right now. He's not sure why he decides on Hitoshi in the end. Maybe because the kid knows he exists, well, kind of. He'd spoken to Hitoshi, even if only through a gaming console. Still better than nothing. He just knows Hitoshi knows about him, and he doesn't want him to... He can't. Be alone. By the time he makes his way into the Shinso apartment, beelining past Yua, who's stood at the stove stirring something, Hitoshi's already awake and getting ready for the day. Obero waits patiently outside the bathroom door, then follows the teen into the kitchen. Morning, Mom. Hitoshi greets as he sits at the table. Morning, kiddo. Yua greets slowly, thoughtfully, Hitoshi's brows furrow at her tone, clearly picking up on the stiffness. Hey, Tosh, listen, you, uh, remember how your uncle and Izuku were going to be at that training camp this week? The boot camp? Hitoshi cocks an eyebrow, leaning on his fist. Yeah, I remember. Uncle Sho goes every year, and Izuku was stoked to go this year. I wish I could have gone, too. Don't say that, 
Obro croaks out roughly as he drags palms over his face in a dry wash sort of way. He goes unheard. Not that he expected anything else, Obero can hardly bear the thought of possibly losing a third kid, the two he cares the most about. Yua's face pinches in that protective, motherly way. Obero sees the genuine relief that Hitoshi wasn't there, cross over her face for a second, before that solemn look of poorly hidden desolation is back. It's hard to be thankful your kid is safe when other kids aren't, one of them being your new nephew. The woman sucks in a slow breath as she turns off the stovetop. She rounds the table and sits across from Hitoshi, reaching a hand out to settle over the teens, which is laying limply on the table. Hitoshi looks skeptically down at where she's holding his hand, but Yua just frowns as she catches the boy's eyes and continues softly. There was an attack on the lodge last night. I just got off the phone with Izashi. An attack? Hitoshi chokes on nothing, back ramrod as he stares in disbelief at his mother. Are... is Uncle Sho okay? Is Suzuku what happened? Your uncle's fine. She shakes her head as she squeezes Satoshi's hand. But Izuku, I'm so sorry, sweetheart, but he was taken by the villains. Obro's back hits the wall as those words leave her mouth, the exhaustion coming out of nowhere. He shouldn't be affected. He knew exactly where this conversation was going the moment she mentioned the boot camp. It's not a surprise, but it still knocks the air out of his lungs. It's not even a second later when his legs give out. He sinks to the floor, face falling to his hands. The sound of static consumes his thoughts. He's not even sure what's going on around him, but he can't be bothered to try and bring himself back. What the hell is he going to do? All right, everyone, this concludes Chapter 28 of UA Survival Guide. Chapter 29 will be next, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.